this video, I'm going to show you how I designed and built my homemade submarine. Most of this work was done before I started YouTubing, so I only have pictures and not that many videos of it. However, it should still make for an interesting watch, because it's one of probably only a few dozen working homemade submarines in existence. I started building this when I moved to Florida in 2019. I did a few surface tests in the same year, and then after 12 months of building, I finally took it underwater, which is what you saw at the beginning of this video. Since then, it's been sitting in my garage collecting dust, but I'm about to start using it again and making YouTube videos with it. Here I'm just going over some of the controls inside the cockpit. Electrical power comes from 12 volt batteries, and pneumatics for cockpit air and buoyancy control come from a pair of 120 cubic foot scuba tanks pressurized to 4000 psi. I designed the sub in two main parts. It has a lower hull, and then a canopy that can open and close, similar to some airplanes. I've designed what's known as an ambient pressure submarine, which is a little bit different from a regular sub. In a regular submarine, the pressure inside is one atmosphere, but the pressure outside is larger than that because of the depth. The difference in pressure causes a structural load on the vehicle. At a certain depth, the structure can't withstand that load, and you experience a sudden catastrophic failure that's almost guaranteed to be fatal. This approach isn't very forgiving of errors or miscalculations in your design, so it's probably not a great option for a homemade submarine. In an ambient pressure submarine, the bottom of the sub is open and the pressure of the air on the inside is the same as the pressure of the water on the outside. Because of this, there's no pressure difference on the vehicle and therefore there's no structural load. Now you may think it's absolutely crazy to open up a submarine underwater, but this actually works perfectly fine as long as the air above the hole is sealed off and has nowhere to go. If you don't believe me, just try the classic experiment of putting a cup upside down in the sink. I've taped a paper towel to the bottom of this cup, and I'm going to push it into my sink upside down. The air inside the cup has nowhere to go, so it stays put. If you look close, you can even see the water line inside the cup. When I pull out the cup, you can see that my paper towel is still dry. So we've established that an open bottom submarine not only works, but can actually be a much better option for a hobbyist, at least from a structural standpoint. Another advantage is that a large enough opening would allow crew to come and go freely, and this is actually how underwater research habitats work. However, there's also a few disadvantages. Firstly, you need a large source of compressed air because as you descend, the volume of the air inside your cabin will compress, so you need to compensate by blowing more air in. Second, you're in a hyperbaric environment, so even if you're perfectly dry, you still need to follow dive tables because of the increased nitrogen in your blood. This really makes the vehicle act more like a diving bell than a regular sub, but the obvious difference is that it's a standalone, self-propelled vehicle. So let's look at how my design works. I start off with a totally dry boat sitting on the surface. When I open a large valve at the bottom of the hull, the cabin begins to flood with water and sink. Water comes up to the bottom of the canopy, which is about at the level of my waist. This is what's known as a semi-wet ambient sub. The reason I've designed it this way is that there's less buoyant airspace to ballast against, so the whole vehicle can be relatively lightweight on dry land. To surface, I blow air into the forward and aft ballast tanks, which are just sections of the hull that are partitioned off with bulkheads and sealed. Once the tanks are blown, the submarine ascends to the surface. The cabin is still full of water though, so the canopy just barely sticks out above the water. I remove the remaining water with an enormous bilge pump that discharges about one gallon every second. This can also be done by using compressed air to blow out the water, but by using the pump I conserve a huge amount of air. After a few minutes, the cabin is pumped dry, and the submarine is sitting on the surface again. Now that we've seen a basic conceptual overview, I'll show you how I built it. The entire vehicle is a single fiberglass shell built over a disposable mold. I used insulation foam to create the profile of the hull, and cross sections at several longitudinal stations. To cover two-dimensional curves, I bent Dollar Tree poster board, and for compound curvature, I built up a surface with masking tape. Once that was done, I began layering fiberglass over it. I did this for several weeks, and probably went through about 20 gallons of polyester resin, until the entire structure was finally rigid enough to stand without a mold, and I dissolved it away with acetone. The same basic process was repeated for the canopy section, but for the front face of it I used a plywood sheet and covered it in several layers of glass to isolate it from the water so that it didn't rot over time. The holes are 21 inches in diameter and will be used to mount the window domes. 
I then added the tail fins for a little bit of directional stability, but mostly aesthetics. After that, I mounted 4 inch casters to the bottom of the hull. This was done because I determined that the sub wasn't shaped right for a regular boat trailer, so it would have to be winched on and off a regular trailer at the boat ramp. Halfway into the build I decided I'd want headlights for night diving, but I wanted them integrated into the body of the sub, so I made some cutouts and attached mounting points for the lights that were recessed a little bit into the curvature of the hull. Then I thickened up the bottom and added stiffeners because this was where all the heavy ballast was going to be carried. After that I mounted two 12 volt trolling motors to either end and sealed up the pass-throughs with flex seal. To drive the motors, I used a dual 60 amp brushed speed controller made by Dimension Engineering. The control signal was a simple 0 to 5 volt analog input from a potentiometer. From here on, most work involved electrical wiring and painting. And here's what the final product looked like mounted on its trailer connected to my truck. At this point, it was ready for its first test. I headed out into the Indian River Lagoon south of Cape Canaveral, and everything seemed to be going pretty well. At full throttle, I crept along at a measly 3 knots using 700 watts of power. But that was okay, because I didn't design for speed. The trouble occurred when I tried to make the dive. The sub teetered back and forth, then finally came to rest at about 45 degrees nose down, half submerged in the river. I was lucky because this was a pretty shallow spot, so the nose didn't have to go down very far before it hit the bottom. But I ended up being stuck for a little while, and had to move around some weights in order to get myself back up on the surface. I went back and simulated the scenario in CAD. I discovered that there was one huge factor I didn't account for. As I flooded the cabin for descent, the submarine wasn't stable in pitch, because the water would tend to slosh in the direction of a disturbance, which would amplify it and make it worse. This effect can be seen numerically on this graph. The red line is what should happen, being negative means the writing moment acts in the direction opposite to the disturbance, but what actually happened is shown in the black line, where being larger than zero indicates instability. This issue was fixed by adding partitions to the hull similar to the slosh baffles that are found in tanker trucks or liquid-fueled rockets, and while I was at it, I just sealed off the partitions and turned them into ballast tanks. After making those fixes, I put the sub in the water again a few weeks later. This time, I got it to dive right.
I dove and came back up successfully, but after I was fully surfaced, my engines weren't running at all. I had electrical power to run my pump and lights though, but I discovered that the box with the control signal connections had been totally flooded with brackish water, causing it to short circuit. Luckily I managed to flag down some boaters, who were nice enough to tow me back to the dock about half a mile away. The engine control failure was a big disappointment, but the buoyancy control, which is what my life really depended on, worked perfectly, so the test was a partial success. This test was done nearly a year ago, and since then I've made lots of updates and fixes to the submarine, and I'll be featuring it in new videos pretty soon, so stay tuned.